Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Scottish Football Show, powered by the Rangers Rabble Podcast. Yet another blockbuster weekend in our top flight. Loads and loads of talking points. And we're going to spend the next hour or so chatting through them with my, my two good buddies here, Connor and Davey. Double shift for me and you, Davey, today. Connor, how are you doing? Hi, no bad, no bad. I um, was did a bit of overtime with work earlier, clearing boxes and stuff out, so a bit of grafting from earlier on the day, so still feeling that a wee bit in the old legs, but apart from that, we're grand. And David, you joined myself and Martin and Stuart earlier on for a chat about obviously what had happened this morning at Dens Park. Um, we will touch on that again at the end of the show, because Connor's got a couple of points just regarding obviously Dundee's pitch, etc. So um, thanks for coming back on tonight. No problem at all. Happy to join you on your birthday, Robert. Sorry, I can't be with you in person, but hopefully it's been a hopefully it's been a good birthday, mate, and you've been well and truly spoiled. Honestly, yesterday I was absolutely seething when I saw Brendan Rogers post match, and he said, "Oh no, tomorrow I'll be celebrating St Patrick's Day." No mention of my birthday, no regard. Um, also, I must say, by the way, happy birthday to my to my old boy, my dad. He is sixty two today, so happy birthday, old Jean. Love you bits. Right, okay, admin is out of the way. Let's delve straight into the action because, as I say, Connor, um, an absolute blockbuster of a weekend. The, the, the race for fourth, really, really uh, exciting. We saw a, 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 a game of two halves, as it were, the old cliche, Davey loves them. Um, at Kilmarnock. Kilmarnock obviously riding out 5 2 winners, but St. John's, sorry, St. Mirren started really, really well in this fixture and, and took the opener. They did, um, you know, and a decent goal for, for the opener, I've got to say. Um, you know, corner kick, as they both were. Um, and, and you thought, you know, the way that they had started the game, um, you know, they looked as if they were, you know, they had their tails up a bit, St. Martin, you know, they looked bright um, in that first half. And you thought, you know, they're, they're fancying it here. Um, because we all know, you know, Rugby Park is is a tough place to go and get results this season. It really is for any team. Um, you know, we've we've seen you know ourselves first hand as Rangers fans how difficult it is to go up there. Um, you know, and it, you were thinking in the first half when I got to half thing, you're thinking, okay, that's the one they've obviously went up there and managed to to sort of stymie Kilmarnock a bit and actually take the initiative. And they did again the, the first goal I think um I mean I'm sure if you ask Derek McKinnis, he'll not be happy as a manager to concede two goals for corner kicks. You never are, but um, they're, they're well taken. Um, there, there's no, there's no doubt in that. Um, and uh, as you say, you know, ultimate game of two halves. But certainly the first half, he thought St Mirren were cruising here to to three points, and it'd have been a huge three points because if they had won that game, St Mirren, um, I, I can believe it would have taken them four points clear of Kilmarnock because there were a point in front of them going into the game. I'm pretty sure. Sure. I might have my mask later on there, but yeah, I, I know they were, you know, looking to get in front. So, yeah, um, you know, so uh, it's that disappointment, I'm sure, for them. But uh, as we'll as we'll come on to, um, what a second half can Harnock David, just on St Mirren, a player that's come to fruition in the last few weeks, certainly maybe in the back burner all season, he's not got the points, I think he serves as, as Boyd Munts, seems to get good delivery into dangerous areas. Now, I, I, I know David, uh, sorry, Derek McInnes might be unhappy in terms of defending the first two goals, similar areas, straight in between the two centre-halves uh, and both the goals coming from there, but Boyd Munts seems to be growing and growing in, in, that, in that St Mirren midfield. I believe he just got a Northern Ireland international call up as well under Michael O'Neill's right. squad. So, uh, yeah. We will give uh, you and Davy a, a yellow card here because it's got to be one of them nights. He had a wee bit of problems earlier on, David, to be uh, fair. Uh, uh, my apologies to your listeners and yourselves there. No, but no, I'm no, sorry. You say he's um, been called up. If it keeps going, then then it'll just dip out. But I'll I'll try my best to maintain as we go along. Uh, but certainly, 
I think if if you look at his performances this season, he, he did hit a spell at the start of the season where he was fantastic. You know, I, I singled out his pass earlier on in the season as a pass of the season that was Scott Allen esque um, at New St Man Park earlier on in the season, and then obviously he had a wee spell where he fell out the team. He, he did pick up an injury and then he struggled to get back in. But I think you can tell there's obvious quality there. I agree with what you are saying in in regards to the, the defending. Though I think Derek McInnes. I'll be absolutely raging for the for the two goals. It's so standoffish for Kilmarnock, unlike them. No attacking the ball and ball watching. You know, so unbecoming of Derek McInnes' side. And it's not just that. You know, the St Martin guys, I mean, Charles Dunn has, has got acres to put that ball away, unchallenged. Uh, you know, it, it just beggars belief. And, and I just don't understand that. Obviously, they've had the suspension in Mayo recently and there's been a reshuffle in the pack um, over the last couple of games to cover the suspension. Obviously, Dees has come back in recently. He had a spell out. So you just wonder if it's players getting used to each other again that sort of caused that calamity because I think that's the only way you can describe it. Really poor defending for Kilmarnock and you have to say unaccustomed to them this season. Absolutely. Connor. just before we got to the second half, there were some... Some some early signs uh, from Kelly. I think Armstrong whips one in a corner in a corner in a, a dangerous area. Watkins gets ahead, and it was a good save from Hemmings. Um, but as you said, they go into the half time. They're two 0 down. You're, you're thinking a draw would be a good result. I heard a, a, a punter on a, on another station saying that at half time a Kelly fan he put a tenner on Kelly to win, and he's probably paid for his the first half of his European trip next season. Um, I certainly, I mean, I would certainly love Dan I because he did get, he did get decent odds on that. Um, I mean, listen, you've got to say fair play to Kelly because, you know, the way the first half had went, it didn't really fall for them so much. As you say, they did have that wee opportunity with, with Watkins. So, yeah, you know, it's a good save. Um, I, I would, I would always argue. Um, you know, even though keepers union, I would still always argue that I, I would want my forward players to to probably be. To be doing better there, or, or to be scoring, uh, but you know it's a decent save. Um, and then you know, I, I think that, that for me the two linchpins that really changed it for for Kilmarnock in the second half outweigh obviously the subs and stuff that came on, who I think had an impact as well. But I think Vassell and Armstrong, you know, the two guys who have been absolutely constants for for Kilmarnock this season. You know, the big man Vassell, the captain, he just he seems to. He has this thing about him where I feel like he goes quiet for a few weeks, where he maybe doesn't do a lot in in certain games, and you don't talk about him so much. Um, I mean, we spoke about loads of commander players this year, you know, Watson, Armstrong, who we will speak about again. Vassell, no so much, you know, because he's kind of been in and out, no one in the squad, but in terms of his what he's actually been doing. But he seems to rock up in, in bigger occasions for them when they need something. They go their way and he just muscles his way through at times to, to make it happen. Um and, and he did for the, the opening goal. Um, you know, he, he, he took it really, really well. Um it's a bit of a it's a long hopeful ball from the goalkeeper, finds its way to him, he gets a second bite at it and, and it's it's two one, it's game on. Well, exactly. You know, it, it, it's like you say, he gets the second bite and it's that tenacity, um, you know. Keep at it, you know. You might think the chance is gone when when you have your first effort and and it's it's no you know scored or whatever. But he keeps pursuing and and obviously when he comes back, he gets that second chance and and pops it away. And as you say, at that point two one, very much game on. You know, there was still I think what thirty five forty minutes left of the game. Um, you know, with extra added time, whatever that was going to end up being. So, you know, it absolutely was game on. Uh, and at that time as well, uh, on on the reverse side of that. St Mirren at that point you've got to just take a breath and, and calm things down a bit okay you've conceded a goal but you're still in front just get your feet in the ball keep a bit of possession take the sting out of Kamala because as soon as they get that goal their tails are up they're thinking right let's go for this we know we can get back into this game now and if, if St Mirren had just been a bit more you know cool headed about it um, it, it could have been different for them because I do think that um, obviously they, they got and, and they get the penalty kick um, come on, like, and it's a penalty kick that you know. I mean, it's a stone wall. Let's not make any bones about that all day long, isn't it? From Flynn, but it's ridiculous for Flynn. I don't understand what he's doing because he doesn't need 
to make the challenge. And Watkins, Watkins, okay, he's in the box, but he's not going anywhere. You know, he, he's at that far side of the box where you want him to be. He, he's got goal, almost goal side himself. And there's, there's, an, there's another defender to the other side as well. So there's two of them there. He doesn't need to go in so clumsily, but I think it was just that bit of a, a panic for him, if I'm honest with you, that franticness that, oh, shit, you know, we've conceded a goal and they're back in again. And he's just, he's tried desperately to try and get the ball and he's made an absolute melee. Um, and, you know, it, it's penalty all day long. And fair play to Daniel Armstrong because there was a bit of a delay before he could take the penalty. I think the, um, the St. Mirren goalkeeper, I believe it was, I think it went down. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with an injury and that's no easy you know you've got a lot of time to think about that and, and he'll have known how big that penalty is because games swing in moments like that you know he scores that and it goes 2-2 obviously but equally if you miss that sometimes that can just deflate that wee bit of momentum you've built up um, but he, he steps up and he, he he takes it well as he tends to do um, Danny Armstrong and at 2-2 you're thinking this is this is Kelly's game now because St Mirren they, it didn't look like they had it in them to to fight back or even to hold out and get the draw. Davey, I just want to touch on uh, Vassell because Connor's picked out some great attributes in terms of his you know he, he's a, he's a bully, he's tenacious. But I think we need to also applaud his mentality because January's come, Kevin Van Veen's coming. All the talks about Kevin Van Veen, uh, he scored umpteen goals last season for Motherwell. He, the big captain's probably thinking, wait a minute here, I'm going to have to fight for my place. And, you know, he's one of the players that you can always seem to count on We come up. And with a couple of others, by the way, I must say, because they're a very good side. It's not just about individuals, but he he's leading by example. That's it. You, the, the key point there is in the last sentence you made, he's leading. He is a leader. He, he's Kelly's natural leader. Uh, and you can tell that. What I think he's got, and the player that Connor didn't pick out, who I thought was terrific in the second half, was Marley Watkins. I thought he was a battering ram in the, this is the second half in terms of he's running off the ball. You know, they, they just couldn't deal with him. He was dropping into pockets. He was linking the play. He, he was bringing Armstrong more into the game. And then he was laying the ball off and then making the move for Armstrong as well. And the, the St. Mirren back, back line were just standing off him and allowing him to drift. But I, I think competition's always healthy for places. And you're seeing that in Kilmarnock for January. Like you say, you know, when you've got the likes, say, Greg Stewart and Kevin Van Veen on your bench and they're no guaranteed starters for you, you know you've got a decent squad. And they certainly have that. They've got great attacking options. I thought Danny Armstrong, once again, pinpoint precision cross. There's no other winger in the league that can make the cross he does. That is very Neil McCann-esque, and I've said this two or three times this year, in the way... But, oh, well, it's 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 come back in, because only a wee second, and he's writing what he says. Danny Armstrong um, is a different kind of... It gives you a different option. They've got width on both sides. Both players seem to deliver quality mm. in the box as well, um, Connor. Um, and you're all right, David. We're just saying there, Danny Armstrong seems to deliver quality in at the box. I think Marley Watkins is probably having his, his best season, to be fair. Um, is he, he's gone again, is he? But we'll, we'll, we'll let him dip out if he needs to. But um, okay, now I'll come back to you, Connor, because I'm doing a bit of heavy lifting with Danny Armstrong. Uh, he get he whips the ball in, Watkins gets the goal, uh, and then we've got another um, long ball effort, and, and Vassell makes it four. And it was four goals in 12 minutes, which really just ended St. Mirren's day. Oh, absolutely. At that point, it, it was game over, really, because even when you go to 3-2, you think, oh, you know, well, they, they can still maybe conjure up a wee opportunity and get in. Um, but at 4-2, it was gone, and, and it's a lovely goal again. I mean, it's don't get me wrong, and, and we will touch on it, I think the defending of St Mirren is appalling, to be perfectly honest with you. But the ball comes over the top to, to Vassell. I think in the initial phase, um, is it Alex Goggage, I think, heads it back into the midfield to try and clear it before it's clipped back over to Vassell. But when it comes over to him, um, he takes it with a plum, you know, he just takes that first touch to calm it down on his favoured right foot and just pops it beyond the goalkeeper. Um, and that that shows the other parts of his game as well. For all his, his ability and all these other things that myself and David have said, he's got a wee bit of quality about him as well in those areas when he, he can put a finish together, and he certainly did. Um and it was just a great goal. And, and to be fair, at that point, you actually feared for St Mirren about just how many it could be. Um, because it looked like Kamarnock were going to score every time they had the ball. Um, well, they did. They did score again. Yeah, they did. They did. 
an absolutely beautiful goal. Okay, you mentioned again the Superman defending, but he'd run for his own half. He's all he, he's just he skipped past. I think it, it's Gogic. I don't know if it would be yeah, there's another defender in, in the picture as I well. Gog, I think it was Gogic, and I think Charles Dunn. I think attempted to stick yep. a leg in. Um, and then he's I, just he goes down in the bottom corner. Yeah, again, brilliant for Davy Watson. Um, I mean, look, uh, Lewis, who's obviously um, a regular in the pod, he's a, 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 you know an avid. Um, Davy Watson fan and, and has, has bigged him up all season and, and, and fair play to Lewis because I think uh, we've maybe slept on that one a wee bit at times in terms of no being um, 100% across it with him but that, that's because the qualities come like has got with, with other areas you can't help but look at players like Armstrong as well but Watson it's a brilliant he picks that ball it must be about 70 75 yards for his aim, you know for the goal and, and his own half and just runs through. I mean, again, I do think, and I, and I have to say it particularly with this goal, when he picks that ball up and he runs, is, is great close control of his feet, but he, he initially runs into a sea of red shirts. There's about four or five St. Byron players on that side of the pitch. None of them even got close to him. None of them put a challenge. It was, they were all about a yard off him. And I, and I can't understand why. And then, because the thing is as well, right, see at that point, if he gets over the halfway line and one of them slides in and fouls him, then you take a booking. You know, it's... Um, in those areas of the pitch, but then Charles Dunn makes a real attempt to get back um, and, and does try and stick a leg out. Um, and Alex Gogic, to be fair to Alex Gogic, I actually think I can slightly forgive him just in the basis that when Charles Dunn tries to make that, that challenge, he kind of gets in Gogic's way and it causes a slight step off of him. And then obviously Watson, to be fair, stands up strong as well because you know, he, he could have, he's got youth on his side. Gogic doesn't really have that, does he? No, no, he doesn't. He, no, um, and as you say, you know, pops it away brilliantly. And you know, what a young talent that boy could could be for them. Um, and that, that's what they've got. They've got a real core of young talent. You look at Davy Watson. You look at Lewis Mayo at the back. Um, you know, guys. You know, like your Armstrongs and your your Vassells and stuff. And it makes you wonder how how other clubs that are sort of in and about in clubs like St Murn or or even Hibs or, or an Aberdeen, how they missed out on, on on identifying these players because Derek McInnes clearly didn't. He knew um, how to bring these players through and, and into the fold. And I mean, it's a superb result for Kelly. It really is. And I think for me, that that solidifies my, my belief that they will finish fourth this season. Just on Watson, because Derek McInnes said, I think maybe between Christmas and New Year, I'd saw a piece he'd done and he was saying, David Watson is great, future Scotland international, but he must add goals to his game. We're definitely seeing that now. I know he got one up at Pataudry, um, and he scored at Celtic Park as well. Um, you know, so, so he's obviously taking on instruction. He's obviously, t- he's, he wants to be better. Yeah, absolutely. He's obviously got that hunger there to, to improve and to take on board what the manager's seen. Um and, and that's what you've got to do because ultimately, you know, the the, the sort of apex, the, the last ceiling for, for David Watson isn't Kilmarnock. You know, his ambitions as a player will be, if he keeps going on the path he's going on, he keeps improving. And, and as Derek McInnes says, adding more goals to his game, which he's gradually starting to do, then, you know, he'll be looking at some point to get a move to a bigger club. Um, and I'm absolutely sure that they'll be looking at him, you know, maybe... Not necessarily this summer, but certainly by the time next summer, Ozan, if he keeps going this way, you couldn't help but have serious interest in the boy. Um, and, and I just think that attitude to hear what the manager saying, go and keep improving yourself week on, week out, you know, no rest in your laurels. Because it'd be easy, he's a young boy. I would say it'd be easy for him to think you've got that big moment, you know, at Parkhead and when he scores that late, late equaliser for Kamalik, um to nick them a what is a rare point um, at, at either side of the Glasgow to be fair um, and you think that's a huge moment for him you know, it'd be easy for him to rest in his laurels and think right, you know what I, I'm the done deal here I've done this you know, I'm I'm doing well I've got this goal here and, and some of the young players might do that he's not done that he's, he's constantly looking for that and I, I just you can't help but be impressed by it just on the uh, Kilmarnock and obviously this season you said that you, you, you kind of think that they're, they're shooing now for fourth position Kilmarnock fans will be fearing the worst in terms of players like David Watson Danny Armstrong 
and even the likes of Vassell being pickpocketed by maybe a League One, League Two side. How important is it that these guys sort of stay around and, and stay on for the journey? Because we've seen previously, you know, Nicky Kabamba at Kilmarnock banging the goals in, leaves Kilmarnock never to be heard from again. It's sometimes there is just a right fit for a player, isn't there, in a club? A hundred percent there is. Um and I think it's it's huge for for Kilmarnock as well to keep these players on board. As you say, it's about that right fit. Um because sometimes you make those moves and it doesn't work. We've seen it. I mean Stevie Clark's Kilmarnock team, um who were the last ones who are a real, real threat and, and really but were a, you know showed good qualities at times as well. They they lost their steam obviously after he left and they lost those players. Um and and for most of them it's not worked out. You know, I think maybe you could argue Greg Taylor being the exception because albeit I think there's still a lot of question marks whether he's actually at the level you need to be at consistently to play for um you know for for, for any half of the old for him. But he's certainly a stand out for that crop because you look at it and you see, well, Greg Kilty, where's he now? He's at St Mum. So it's it's not worked for him leaving. Um, you know, Jordan Jones, who at the time, ironically enough, and I don't think it's a stretch to say this, Jordan Jones was kind of talked about in the same way that we talk about Danny Armstrong right now. You know, he was that player for Kilmarnock under Stevie Clark. He was the creative spark, um, you know, who could pull them out of holes and could put great balls in the box and find good finishes. And again, obviously, he came to us at you know another time. You never know; it could have it could have worked out better for him. So I do think these players have to take note of that and and consider seriously where they where they, they feel that they, they're going to fit in. Because if they keep going on in this journey and, and keep along with Kelly, I don't think it's a stretch to say that if they keep building with this squad and adding to it. Next year, maybe the year after, they could certainly go and ask a question to lift a piece of silverware again, um, which would be huge for them because I don't think have they lifted a cup since what 2012, I think was the last time they won the Scottish Cup. So I'm sh- and I'm sure Derek McInnes will be hoping for that as well. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. Listen, great comments coming in, keep them coming. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, as always, we'd ask you just to, to like, subscribe. Tell a friend, <laughs> it does help the podcast sort of grow. Um, okay, then we'll leave Rugby Park. I, I want to go up to Dingwall actually because I think things are hotting up down the bottom. Um, Ross County welcoming hearts. I don't think anyone before kickoff gave uh, Dom Cowney's men a prayer of picking up anything, uh, despite you know being in and about it in the playoff places. Hearts gone there looking really comfortable in third, and I think that might actually be a problem, which I'll allude to later on in this conversation. Uh, but listen, Simon, Simon Murray had the bit between his teeth all afternoon, Connor. Mm-hmm. Uh, really lively, and he's got to keep that up between now and the end of the season if County are going to you know, pull St Johnson right into it. Absolutely. Um, you know, they, they need Simon Murray to be, to be firing, and as you say, keep that bit between his teeth, um, him and you know, Brophy as well. Um, massive help if, if they can keep that going because that's 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 their goals there, and you can maybe label a bit of criticism at them over the course of the season to argue have they scored enough goals? Um, and well, you can, answer, you can answer that question with that first chance that Money whips across the face of the goal, and Jordan Van Vossen turns up and puts it straight over the bar for a bit of, for a bit <laughs> of yard out. Dear me, there. <laughs> God, aye. Um, oh, listen, I, I, I'd seen that chance go, and I thought, how has he missed it? How has he actually missed it? And you know that way, because you're watching the highlights, you know he must have missed it because his name wasn't in the school sheet, right? He's in the, you still know, can't the, believe it. Aye, and you still can't believe it. You're still going, no, somebody's going, he must have. How the? Because it's a brilliant ball across. I know, obviously, sliding in and that, and it's maybe sort of my type, but that should just be, he should be sliding that into the net. Him, and the ball should be going into the net there, basically, is what should be happening. And you think somehow, you think surprised by the aggression that came in it? Because, as I say, Murray did seem to be lively early doors. Um, he, he, he shifts away and then it's pop, it's straight across the goal. And I think, as you say, Jordan White's just trying to get on to the end of it and, and, and he's lunging almost. Yeah, I think I, there's an argument for that. I think clearly it might have been a case, as you say, he's, he's maybe not expected it to be as ferocious a ball across, but. As a striker, particularly somebody like Jordan White, who is an experienced hat for 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 Ross County, you know he's 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 been with him for a long time now, so he knows 
you know, they, they used to be in. I think he should maybe anticipate it a bit better than he does. Um, you know, because you can't really, he, he's got to score that. And to be fair, I think it's a bit of a tale of how Jordan White's season's been because he's been very up and down. And I think there's been a noticeable tapering off him. I, I don't think he's reached the levels he's been at before for, for County. I think he's had a number of big moments like that that haven't fell for him in terms of he's not been able to convert. Um, that being said, though, um, he's still a nuisance and cause he's a, a, a havoc for defenders. And that can only help guys like Simon Murray you know, get into the, the spaces that they're doing, obviously. Um, he was ultimately the key man in the, in, in the game. Davey, welcome back. Um, we're just talking Ross County Hearts, just into the, the first chance of the game fell to Jordan Van Vossen. He was unlucky. And then, uh, you know, Hearts were really in the game. Kenny Vargas uh, has a chance. Tony Sibbett gets a shot away. Vargas then hits the bar. And then it's up the other end. Tony Sibbett sleeping and Simon Murray profiting. Well, Simon Murray, he's not going to win any beauty contest any days, but uh, you have to say two fantastic goals that he scored and he stretched hearts here. But do you know what? It's just a simple ball over the top and behind for Jan Danda that splits Tony Sibic and he's standing there ball watching. And again, you know, simple, simple football. You, you have to wonder about the organisation at Hearts here. I felt, you know, defensively they were really poor. Civic, Rolls and Kingsley organisation between the three of them was horrendous, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. And both goals are, you know, of our are of a similar fashion in terms of the way that they lost both goals. And all credit to Simon Murray, he's on a bit of strong vein of form this half of the January transfer window and you have to say he's a large part of why County are sort so, of uh, creeping up on or uh, at least keeping tandem with Aberdeen at the moment so you've got to fancy that they're always in with a chance in a game that their problem this season is On you go Connor just finished off from their problem this season is <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think I think the problem this season is, is actually not been since Don Kerry's come in because he's he's actually picked up a bit of form. You look at the form table, um, sort of last five games they've picked up eight points. Yeah, and you look at St Johnston in comparison, only picking up four points. So if you are if you are if you're saying good night, everybody. <laughs> if you are um, with uh, you know look if you, if you are going to look into that, then you see that you know. They're probably going in upper direction with St. Johnston or not. And obviously, we'll talk to St. Johnston in just mm, a moment. Yeah. Um, what did you make it, Yandanda? Because it's easy for him now. He signed a pre contract with Hearts. Could just be sort of wandering about the pitch. He was really influential throughout. He was. Uh, he impressed me because sometimes, you know, when you've pre signed for a club and you've got a player who you know is going to move to that club in the summer, I think, and, and credit to Don Cowie here as well, by the way, because it's a brave move to decide I'm going to play this guy knowing that he's going to move to that club in the summer. And it, cause that can have psychologically, there can be an impact there. You can, you know, maybe have a dip on, as you say, you can maybe just sort of maraud without doing much because you don't maybe want to upset your future employers, but no, not a bit of it at all. I thought he was, he was excellent again and, and just showed exactly why hearts have had the interest that they have had in him. Um, and they've decided to, to sign him because, Again, you know, Davy says it's a simple ball over the top. And from a defensive point of view, yeah, they should deal with it. But I think it's a great ball he's played because he's he's in the half turn as he plays it. So he's sort of clipped it over. Um, and I think it's more to spot the run that, that Simon Murray being there um, shows a real bit of quality um, that, that he does possess. So I, I was I was impressed with Yand and I thought that was one of his better performances this season, 100%. And that we all left Hearts fans purring about what they can expect next season. Another man who impressed, I thought, throughout was was George Wickens. We've spoke about him uh, on the pod over the last few weeks. Um, you know, he, he seems to be a big goalie in stature up on loan from, a, is it Fulham? Um, and, you know, they'll be lucky to keep a hold of him, whichever division they're in next season. But he was pivotal again, pulled over a couple of good saves from Alan Forrest. And, and then the free kick. Arrives now. This is a first uh, VAR decision, so I'll come to you because I've got nowhere else to go to. <laughs> TV's pulled out, but it's uh, the, the free quick, the free kick for me is 
I, even Brophy debated it. I, I don't know. I think it's he, he's he's it's one of them. You're you're probably getting in that area of the pitch and maybe um, mm. not elsewhere. So a bit angry, sort of gets caught under him, doesn't he? And he sort of rolls over. But uh, anyway, mm. three kicks hit and a lovely hit hit by Stephen Kingsley. But you, Lauren Shanklin with a bit of gamesmanship, would you call it? I would, yes, and I am the only hope that my wife I. Uh, holds up otherwise you'll just need to ask oh, him this is the end of the show no listen it's uh, he's trying to be clever Warren Shanklin um, uh, however it's very sloppy for him as well because it's a brilliant finish for Kingsley it really is and you know listen I've said before I'm a keeper I'm always going to stand by my goalies and quite frankly I'd be I'd have reacted the same way that Wickens did if, that, if it was me I'd have been fuming that he's just done that to me albeit I can't sit here and tell you that, I, that he would have absolutely got to that if Shanklin doesn't block his view because you know it is in the corner and it would have been a very difficult save for him to make however Shanklin has to know that he's offside there I, I can't see how he doesn't because every player is in front of him all that line for the for the free kicks, he's got to know. And what he should have done is see even if he's just a frat where he moves to when you see the movement as the free kicks hit, where he ends up, if he starts there, I don't think he gets chopped off because I don't think he would have been impeding the goalkeeper's view because he wouldn't be standing directly in front of him. But when you see it as it's hit and he's just stood directly right in front, you can he. You know, it it might be something that they've tried to work on in training to try and you know, they know Kingsley's got the quality, so can you maybe put the keeper off a wee bit? But you've got to be clever and you've got to do it for, from an onside position. And he's 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 a you know he's a mile offside. And I just I can't understand why he doesn't understand that. Um but you know, it's one of those ones where it's unfortunate for Stephen Kingsley, who scores a wonderful free kick, um, only for it to not count. So the history books will not reflect that he scored that free kick. Um but as I say, Shankland, if you're going to be clever, be a bit more, you know, bit more intelligent and your spatial awareness. We spoke about Wickens earlier. He then saves one for Vargas. Oda gets one to make it 2-1, but it's three points uh, for, for Ross County. And, and you know, you hear uh, Don Kerry after the game, massive three points, just sort of saying how good Hearts are. I wanted to come to you on Hearts now. They're in this position corner. They are literally playing against themselves. They're 11 points clear. Uh, of Kelly in fourth, they're 15 points behind our sales Rangers in second as it is at the mm. moment. Um, is there a case that they know they're going to finish third now? So as much as they are still playing, and I'm sure Stevie Nacer is still pushing them, psychologically, this could be some sort of fall off. Yeah, I think you could. I think that's, that's probably what it is. But what I would say they've got to do, I... Taking out the equation of the fact that they, they've got third place sewn up, right? Because they have, I mean, albeit mathematically, they can be caught and they have to be wary that they can't just go and lose every game because if they do, then there's every chance, like Aberdeen did last season, they'll get, you know, toppled from a seemingly unassailable position. So they might need to be careful of that. But it's not as if, okay, we've got third, you know, wrapped up. There's nothing really else for us to play for this season. Because there is, they've got a Scottish Cup semi final. Um, you know, they've got an opportunity to win a piece of silverware, obviously. I hope they don't. Um, uh, and I'm backing us to, to beat them, of course. But you want to keep momentum building with, with big games like that you're in because you're going to get a game like that and a streak of poor performances or, you know, not winning games of football. That just makes that harder. Whereas if you go into it full of confidence, you've got wins behind you. Um, it can drive you forward. That is that to me is better. So that should be their motivation, and that should be the thing that, that Stephen A. Smith is he's using to get them motoring and going as well. Because they also have to understand, which is another factor for them that, that they can have an impact on. They could find themselves not getting into the conference league group stage automatically because bizarre as it sounds, if Aberdeen win the Scottish Cup. That's who the automatic Europa Conference League group spot goes to. It's the Scottish Cup winners or whoever finishes third if it's not, you know, if it's Rangers or Celtic essentially that win the cup. So they can have an impact, an influence on that if Aberdeen were to beat 
Celtic and then they could get through to a final and beat them. But, you know, for me, I just think that use your, your cup ambitions as your motivation just to keep motoring and build a wee bit of momentum. I also think as well, just to touch on Stephen A. Smith, I think, um, it, you know, he, he's somebody that I'm sure, you know, as a player, he never lacked that drive to want to go and do things. Um, you know, it got him to be a Premier League player for a couple of seasons, so he had something. And I think, uh, I'm sure he'll be in the changing room and whatnot. What I would say is, sometimes he needs to stop playing the victim card as well. Because uh, <laughs> I don't have that. I mean, his comments after the game against County, he can't have any complaints. They didn't deserve anything for that game. And that's exactly what they got. So for me, as I say, they just have to build momentum, look into the cup as their real opportunity to go and get silverware. Listen, uh, guys, as I say, keep your comments coming in. I have saved a couple that I'm going to put to Connor at the end of the show. So I think there's one from Paul there and one from Alan Kelly as well. So stay tuned, guys, because we will get them answered. But at the end of the podcast, they're a bit more relevant in a wider a wider scale of things. OK, we'll go to uh, Celtics and Johnson. Um, listen, it's not it's not a great look because we know what happened today in their game got called off. But Celtics have gone back top of the league, albeit hopefully temporarily, um, with, a, with, with a, a 3-1 win over St. Johnston, Connor. This one, it was always going to play out this way in the sense that St. Johnston were going to have to defend really, really well and hope Celtic had a bit of an off day and Celtic just kept chapping at the door and eventually they got in. Uh, they did. They certainly did. Um, you know, uh, on another day, um, that game could have been six or seven for Celtic. I mean, I think they had, was it three goals or something? Two dropped off, I think, for offside. Um, <clears throat> correctly. I must admit, you know, there was no conspiracy theory. They were the correct decisions. Um, but they were certainly knocking on the door, as you say. Um, uh, and the issue for St. Johnson is they don't score enough goals up top. And defensively, they're not good enough to ride out 90 minutes. I know, you know, some might trip back at me in the, in the chat and say, well, what, what about earlier in the season? They went to Celtic Park, kept a, Park Ed, sorry, Wolf, uh, kept a clean sheet um, and got a 0-0 goal. Which I accept, but it's different times. You know, that was early, really early in the season that they they done that. Um, so they hadn't had the the major knocks of the confidence and the changes of manager and everything that goes along with that at the time. So, um, yes, they done it there, but they were never going to go and replicate that um, th- this weekend. And you know, Celtic did just keep on hammering the door, um, and you thought, you know, the first. Chopped off goal with Kyogo should have real, been a real warning sign for them uh, if they hadn't already had enough warnings. But to be fair to them, pieces of heroic defending and goal line clearances and stuff, you know, like Awata had a great effort, you know, blocked off the line. Um, as I say, because then Kyogo scores, but it's chopped off, and you think, right, you've got a lifeline there, you know, and it didn't even take Celtic five minutes to go and actually get the goal anyway. Four goals in this game, and for me, the biggest talking point was John Barnes's pronunciation of Iwata. Why was he calling him Iwata all through this? All through this, this, uh, this highlight reel, it was, it was it was doing my head in. I thought, why is he doing this halfway through the season? Like, surely you you call him that at the start. We all call him Iwata, no Iwata. Like he's like higher. I mean, he does that all the time. No, he's the same guy that that, that calls Tavernier Tavernier. Um, well, we've got a pundit that does that as well. I'm talking to you, Lewis. Uh, he calls him <laughs> to their knee as well, but uh, we'll say no more about it. It's, it's just a strange one, that. It was puzzling me all through the game. I, I don't want to take away the performances, but that was a strange performance, John Barnes, if you're watching. <laughs> it was indeed, I, I don't know. I don't know, it was then Iawata, I, I don't know. Iawata? Um, was he trying to draw the accent or something? Like Iawata cup of tea or something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. You know that, Nick. There was, as you say... Um, Kyogo uh, gets them up and up, up running, and it's Nicholas Kuhn actually who I noticed Celtics wingers seem to like to they cut inside a lot mm. to put balls in. Maybe Yang's slightly different; he likes to go on the outside and, and take his man on. But Kuhn seems to want to come in on that left foot, puts the ball in, and it's 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 easy pickings for for Kyogo at the back step. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's. It, it, it's as good wing play, you've got to say, and, and you know, Kuhn in particular, he's a player who's, <clears throat> I don't think the Celtic fans particularly have been 100% sold on. Uh, to be fair, 
neither have we thus far on, on this show in terms of what you've seen from him. He said flashes are real good moments, but there's still question marks over him. But he done really well um, at the weekend. And, and as you say, flashes across and, and Kyogo's not going to miss for there. I mean, it's it's as near walking the ball into the goal as you're going to see, really. Um, and at that point, I don't think, as much as we say it with Chagrin, I don't think you could have argued that the um, that Celtic didn't deserve to actually have have a lead because they had that many opportunities and that was well taken um, for, for their point of view. And, and Kyogo, I must say, just to touch on it, um, I thought Kyogo looked a lot more like his old self actually in that game. Um, albeit you always have to carry with these. So the words out of mouth in the sense that he, he seems to have come back into the side. No one's talking about Adam Ida too much now, whereas a couple of weeks ago everyone was screaming for Ida to start. Um, mm-hmm. Kyogo gets his goal and then start of the second half, he turns provider, he whips one across the, the it's actually a decent ball down the line from my uh, it's Greg Taylor who finds him, um, puts it in the box and, and, and Kuhn's got a tap in. So that is walking the ball into it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, listen, again, it's great play, you can't deny that and Kuhn, you know, uh, finishes it off. However, what on earth are St Johnson's defenders thinking? I, I cannot understand He's somehow, that ball's been played in, he's managed to, there's, there's four of the defenders, so they're holding that line as if, I don't know what they're trying to play there, nobody's followed Kuhn, he's not offside because he's obviously timed it perfectly because you've got the St Johnston boy who's tried to block the cross, keeping him onside, and nobody, nobody seems to recognise that, and he just drifts in, and you know you cannot allow players to be totally free as a bird for a tap in five, six yards for your own goal without not only a defender near him, but without a defender even in a camera shot other than the, the one who's played him on. I mean, it's it's really dire defending and it surprised me to a degree in that, as I said, they were never going to hold out for 90 minutes, but Craig Levine teams, if there's one hallmark of his teams is usually defensively, they're quite good. Um, you know, usually they're stubborn and, and they don't usually make easy mistakes like that um, but fair play you know Kuhn gets the goal and I'm sure um, you know that will, will possibly do his, his confidence a bit of good as well You then look at the, at the third O'Reilly some good work on the left hand side gets a, a bit of a fizzed ball into um, James Forrest who picks his, his, his spot perfectly really. and that's his, his 12th goal against St Johnson the most goals he's scored against any of the other clubs in the top flight, yeah, it seems to it seems to have a game against the Johnson. I think the last goal he scored was against them as well when they went to McDermott. So, I uh, he does enjoy that particular friction. And to be fair to him, you know, for all the tidy football that were played for the, the other two goals when they were kind of walked in, this one is the pick of the bunch. I think it's a real, real good finish. Him, um, and something that I think, unfortunately, is he's sort of I, I wouldn't anybody say because I think I heard was it. I don't know if it was a commentator in sports scene the highlights talking about how he's kind of winding down his career. I don't think he's winding down his career. He's not that old. I think it may be that he's winding down his time at Celtic. There might be the case that in the summer, possibly he moves on to Pastors New, um, which wouldn't, I don't think, be a bad thing for him. I think, you know... Do you see him playing in, in the colours of anyone else in Scotland? I don't think I could, and I don't know if... Uh, I, I... The only one that springs to mind is probably Hibbs. I could see him going to Hibs. Um, Edinburgh Derby against his brother. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that to me is probably why I think he would do it. I think he would love the opportunity to play against his brother. Um, you know, maybe we'd want to play with his brother at Hearts. But I think that was my next the, question. Could could could, um, he, could he play on the same side? Well, if it wasn't Hearts, I would say aye. But of course, you know the way that Hearts are viewed by that side of the city, that they're viewed kind of is the Edinburgh Rangers, in effect, you know, um, and I, th- I think with that backdrop, he might find himself, you know, causing a bit of uproar if he goes there, so, but Hibbs, I think, would be a good chance, and I actually see, to be fair, if I'm Hibbs, given that where he's at in his career, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, I don't think it would cost him really anything, um, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, I'm going, wow, that'd be quite a good sign for him, because you imagine you had... Forrest on one side, Martin Boyle on the other side. I mean, that's lightning quick pace you're talking in, 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 in two wings um, for Hibs if they want to make that move. So that that I could see being a possibility. Um, apart from that, 
I would I would maybe imagine he would. It's difficult because I don't know if he could go down to the Championship of England anymore. I don't know if he's past that point. Um, it's not to say he couldn't potentially still go to one of the lower half teams there, maybe. But I I, I do see that in the summer he, he may well go. But it, to, to, to the goal itself, though, it's a great finish and it shows that bit of quality that he's still got um, in, in his locker. Um, and, you know, listen, from a Scottish point of view as well, Getting the nationals coming up before going to the Euros, it's it's good to you know in the case that you have injuries to have a fully fit James Forrest available to pick from should you need to call upon him because he can bring that that wee bit to, to the game at times. Don't you be wishing injuries on the I, 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 obviously <laughs> you know but, <laughs> injuries, but it's not a bad backup option to have. Certainly yes, not. He's just on. I think someone in the comments said that he's in a four-year deal. He has not. He's, he's got. He's got a uh, deal runs until twenty twenty-five. So he'd have a twelve months left in the summer. Aye, but what I'm saying is, if he doesn't go to say he will. But what I'm meaning is, I reckon in order for Celtic to get any value and money-wise, and I think the fact that he's had so many injuries, I'm not so sure Brendan Rodgers will look at James Forrest as somebody that going forward in the next season will be part of those plans because they want to, to, to refresh it a bit. Um, but, oh, you know, as a fair point, he could stay until next summer, but any money they would get for him would be gone because if he doesn't sign a contract by, I think it would be January, he's then open to be signed in a pre-contract without having to, they don't even need to really um, pay any fee for that. So we'll wait and see. I just don't see him getting a new contract. David P, welcome along and thank you very much. Um, you've got a lovely singing voice. Thanks very much. Um, okay. <laughs> Just on, on, you know, obviously St. Johnson did pull a goal back, but it was interesting, Craig Levine in his post-match just saying, look, we, we couldn't string two passes together. You know, that's quite, if you're a St. Johnston fan, that's worrying as we touched on earlier. The form's gone out the window. The the they're nowhere near it. Kim here on the upward, you'd be you'd be you'd be far stretched to think, you know, they, they, they could end up in this playoff place, which they brought him in to avoid. I think their next match is it after the national breaks at home to Dundee. Yeah, absolutely. It is a huge concern for them. And to be fair, he wasn't wrong. He absolutely wasn't wrong because if you watch that game, you know, even in the highlights package, anytime they had the ball, they didn't Look like doing anything worth it, worth it, worth it. Um, I'm not John Barnes here. I'm not part of John Barnes here, aye. Um, but you know, I, I think, listen, I don't think he needs to be too critical of his side for a game like that because you don't expect much out of that. Yes, there are things he could have done better, as I say, he can defend the goals better. But if I was him, I'd be taking the positive aspect that they've gone there and they've got a goal. St. Johnson don't often go. To Parkhead or Ibrox and score goals. It's just not something that happens on a regular basis. Um, obviously, they've had some notable results at, at both grounds at times, but it's very, very rare. So, you know, we've got to take advantage of that because it's a good goal that they score. It's a good ball in, and, and Big Stevie May gets up with a header. Um, fair play, it's a good save for Joe Hart and um, the young boy whose name has now escaped me, um, <laughs> Smith. It's a brilliant finish for him. His first goal. I mean, you know, a young boy played at St Johnston. If your first goal comes in Glasgow, you're going to be delighted with that. Um, and I think, in that aspect, take the positives out of it. The flip side, and this is where I will be slightly critical of Celtic. They, I cannot understand what goes on in their defenders. They can't. They, they seem incapable of keeping clean sheets, uh, particularly at Parkhead when they're playing against these teams. And it's it's and it's always late goals. You know, so this is another one of those examples where the difference in this game was that they killed it off. Do you know what I mean? They got 3 0 up, so it didn't matter. Whereas we've seen throughout the season and the results like Motherwell, Kilmarnock, when they've went there, that they didn't kill the games off. They, they were only winning 1 0, and then they conceded goals really late on in the game to tie it up. Um, just poor from their point of view, because Stevie May, he just overpowers. Um, he's man, and then obviously you know the young lads that the, the, the quickest to react to it, Smith. So you know, if I'm St Johnson, just take a bit of heart in that and move on. Dundee's a big game for them. That's a, a bit of a tayside side derby. Um, although I'm never sure which one's the bigger one, if it's Dundee United or Dundee. But um, you know, either way, that's that's a derby match. They'll want to win that, and 
if they can get a result in that, that will just give them a, a lift that they, they need because it's so tight down at that that bottom end. And I mean, anything could happen. Ross County look like they might pull themselves out of the fire here. Um, and then you're looking at St. Johnson and Aberdeen right in front of them thinking, you know, you, you're getting dragged into this. Just, just to finish up on this one, on Celtic at centre back, you know, Williams saying there in the comments they look shaky when they put Iwata at the back, and then I think Brendan Rodgers recognised that, brought Lagabielka on, but it is a position that's been, you know, a, a bit of an issue throughout the campaign. They spent a lot of money on Lagabielka and Navroki. Neither of the two have really made an impact. With Carter Vickers, who's been injured, struggling for fitness, apparently they're managing him back. He only played seventy-five minutes yesterday, but. There's question marks over him. I think he's only played 17, 18 games in the league this season. So it is, a, it is an area of concern. Yeah, it is a, a, a huge area of concern for them, um, particularly when they come up against bigger quality. Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, obviously, you know, when they come to Ibrox, hopefully, hope we can cause them problems. But, um, you know, the way the top six picture shaping up, you know, there's no doubt that Hearts can cause them problems. They've already done it twice this season. So, you know, that... That could be a problematic for them as well, and I think um, you know it's it's a strange one because with Narovsky, you've seen him more than Lager Bielka. Um, you know he he's played made one or two appearances here and there. Lager Bielka, I feel like I haven't really seen him since since the first Old Firm game where he you know kicked the back of Dessel's leg, but somehow was fouled. Um, you know, so I think it's. It's not been convincing the signings. And the thing is, I'm pretty sure, if memory serves me right, that he did say when he came in that he was he was signing off on the signings himself, you know, that he was the one making those decisions. Now, listen, he might just be saying that to say face or pole, and that might not be the case. You know, managers don't always tell the truth in those situations because you don't want to throw your board under the bus. But it's just not been... Because I'm thinking back to when Brendan Rodgers was first at Celtic and the defence that he had then. It was a decent defence. You know, he had, was you know, Svitchenko, Simunic, Boyata, Lustig, um, you know, and their players he brought in. Whereas I'm looking at who he's brought in this season and I'm going, these 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 guys are the cutting the mustard. They're really not. They've got away with it in a number of occasions because they don't have to deal with many people coming, you know, uh, you know actually attacking them so often in games. But without Carter Vickers, they, they really look shaky in, in defence. And of course, the other worry for them was that they were missing Liam Scales at the weekend as well. So absolutely not ideal. OK, we'll, we'll go to for Park. Um, this one actually could have implications on Ross County for reasons that we'll speak about at the end of this game because some some VAR howlers, we'll say. Um, you know, no wins in 11 matches, Premier League matches for, for Aberdeen granted this one. Theo Bayer on the back of a, a Canada call-up, so it should really show us um, how well he's done for them this season as well. Um, free kick, second phase, Mugabe flicks it on, Casey's blocked by McKenzie early doors, and then we do get the breakthrough, Baron to McGrath, Mayowski off the post, and, and clocks him with a, a really good finish. I actually think he takes it on the volley. It, yeah, I think so. I, I, I'm not, I, I, can't, I think it is the volley. There's part of me thinking, did it come off the ground and is it a half volley? But I know he takes it in the volley and it's, it's a wonderful finish for him. Um, and again, listen, Leighton Clarkson, you know, he does possess a bit of quality like that. And him, unfortunately, he's not showed it anywhere near enough this season. Neither has any Aberdeen player, with maybe the exception of Bojan Mijowski, um, although he seems to have stepped off that a wee bit recently. But um, no, he takes it well, Leighton Clarkson. Um, and it's a... Uh, a huge moment for Aberdeen to get in front in that game because it was always going to be tricky coming off the back of the Dundee result and the way things had, you know, been coming to fruition after Neil Warnock left, you know, it's been a bit weird. It's been so start-stop. You've had so many moments this season with Aberdeen where you think, but is this the, you know, the turning point for one of a Is this the moment that they're, they're going to shift um, and, and click into gear um, when they get a big result? Because they get a big result against Kilmarnock. Can't forget that, you know, putting them out of the cup. And then they followed that up with a really poor display at Dundee. So, you know, it doesn't always follow that they have these big results and then follow up. Um, but you know, that was a huge one because that was, I think, that was a a, a, a potential banana scare. And I feel for Ross County, you know, they kind of catch a break. Aberdeen keep losing every week and they keep losing. And the one week Ross County win, 
Aberdeen decide to rock up well in it's oh how unfortunate for them. But you obviously you say they can't catch a break and then this uh the VAR decision, you know, the ball comes in, I think it's a spittle corner, comes in, it seems to hit Theo Bayer and an area we'll discuss in a moment, out to the edge of the, the box and, and Lennon Miller from distance finds the back of the net, wheels away in celebration, and then Willie Combs called to the monitor. Uh, honestly, I mean, I, I absolutely, totally sympathise with Stuart Kettlewell um, and his frustrations because I cannot understand why that goal is disallowed. And, and there's two clear reasons why it shouldn't be disallowed. And I think it's important to say one of the reasons is a matter of the laws, the rules of the game. It's, it's pure facts. And, and, and that it's been... Sorry, I need to put my laptop. It's been put to the, you know, referees have said this season that if the ball strikes an arm and build up to a goal, if it's not the player that scores the goal that, that's arm it hits, then the goal will stand. That's been the sort of precedent they've set this this year when they've said that. And then they've not consistently followed that up there because how can... The old bear doesn't know much about the ball coming off his arm in the first place, right? But it doesn't impact the actual goal that scored um, if, if you, Lennon Miller I, th- I just I can't it's one thing if Willie Collum gives that decision on field right if he blows his whistle and goes and orders a handball and, and gives a free kick before Lennon Miller struck the ball okay you would debate it and say it's a bit harsh but it would be a, a nothing that's real you would kind of get by it what I don't know is why VR decides he's made a clear and obvious error there because he hasn't he hasn't made any error at all um, also the other reason is that it sort of hits bare round about here just beneath the shoulder that for me I, I've always been understanding if it's any contact to the ball is made above the sort of shot line and it can't be given as a handball so I I don't know what Stephen McLean who I think it was it was on VR is thinking when he sends Willie Collum over. And moreover, I don't know why Willie Collum's looked at it in the monitor as well and felt it, it deemed it because it's it's the inconsistencies. I mean, Kettlewell said and pointed out they had they had one go against them against Ross County um not so long ago when Latoury doesn't just handball it, but it actually he's actually able to bring it down because of the contact on his arm and control it and then that allows the goal. Um they were scored so to me in short, if the rule is if the, the, the player scoring the goal, if it's not his arm that comes off, it should count, then they've completely got that one wrong. Well, listen, the second half is where I think Motherwell took um, Aberdeen to task and, and really tried to push for that equaliser. They had numerous chances. I think Theo Bear was in there. Andy Halliday is a really late one that you think he's got to do better with. And then comes another incident for Willis Collum to, to scrutinise and have a look at. And that one seems to be below the area that we've just spoken about. Yes, aye, it's on the elbow. And again, he's got it wrong. And uh, I, I can't understand how, because you've already you've set yourself a precedent in this game of football, right? When you chop off Motherwell's goal, you've set that's the precedent for the handballs we've given here, right? Okay, well then, two questions I have. When you see the highlight back, Willie Collum is standing in a perfect position to see it. He's right behind it. He can see it. Nobody's obstructing his view. He's maybe three or four yards away. He can see that that ball's come off the M. Shinny's arm, right? There's no getting away from that. He sees that. Now, he decides clearly that the only way he doesn't give that penalty is for him to decide he doesn't think it was an unnatural position. And that's a clear and obvious error. That's where VR should have stepped in and sent him to the monitor because what he maybe misses and what you see in the replay is when it comes down and Graham Shinny hits his, his arm. Shinny does make a slight movement, just a slight movement, out to the ball to put his arm out there in the first place that stops it. And for me, that's a penalty. I, 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 again, I agree with Stuart Kettlewell said. He said, look, would it, you know, is it harsh? Yes, but that's the standard we set this season, and those are the penalties that have been getting given, so therefore that should be given as a penalty. Absolutely. And I was going to say... Don Kerry will be just as angry, but he doesn't look like he's got an angry bone in his body, does he? The wee man, he looks the nicest, most pleasant man in the Scottish Premiership. So Don's probably sending Willie Collum a bunch of flowers and saying, don't worry about it, mate, you'll be all right. 
Um, okay, then one game left. We've got a couple of questions for Connor at the end, and then we'll we'll wrap it up and tell you what's coming on the podcast. So do stick with us. Um, Hibs v Livy. Livingston had got their only win away of the season at Easter Road, batting August before this one. But Connor, the Hibs were not in the mood to, for a vengeance, were they? they? They set out their stall nice and early, and it was wave and wave after attack on Shamal George's goal. Yeah, it was. I um, fair play, Hibs. You know, I think a uh, good performance for them. We've said that a few times this season, actually, but they've ended up somehow contriving not to get the result they should have got, and I they, they got what they deserved there. Um, as you say, we're just paper and Shamal George's goal. Um, and there's you know, it doesn't matter. You could be Manuel Neuer. You you cannot possibly save. Wave after wave after wave and shot after shot. You just can't. Eventually, one's going to get one or two are going to get by you, and they and they did. And they were they were all, I think, decent goals. I think again, Livy show just that fragility they seem to have at the back, um, and it's it's the reason that uh, that they, they almost assuredly will be going down. I mean, I think that's them now cut what ten points adrift at the bottom of the table. So you're looking at not only are you going to go down Livingston, but you're potentially going to go down with a whimper. Because if my maths is correct, they could go down by mid-April, officially. Um, because I think a couple of games in the split, if they were to lose to particularly County and Aberdeen, who are the next two nearest teams to them, then that pretty much consigns them to championship football next season. Um, but the defence isn't doing them any favours. I see as good as Hibs were, and they were, and they were, they were at it, they were sharp. Um, they really, really got it, at Livy, um, and and thoroughly deserved the goals they got, which I, I felt were taken well. I mean, they were two up after seven, eight minutes. You know, I mean, that's what if you're Livingston and you're gonna go into a away game like that, you want to hold out, you want to be tight, get through the first twenty minutes, half an hour, still goalless. Um, you know, it's those wee phases of the game. That's what managers always talk about. It's cliched stuff, but it's what they talk about. Those phases. And they failed miserably, you know, once again. So, you know, as much as I've got sympathy for, for wee David Martindale because, you know, we, we like him in this show, I have no sympathy for his players because they're badly letting him down this season. It's where we've spoke about numerous times, Hibs' is better players are in midfield and attack. So if you're going to get at them, you need to put the defenders under pressure. Levy just didn't do that enough. Uh, I think they'd maybe... <laughs> One chance late on, Singari and, and Yenge were involved. But you look at the Hibs goals, far too easy. Adam Lafond were involved in a couple. My leader, who mm. I've you know been nothing but impressed with since he came in. Hope you know Hibs will be hoping to keep on to keep a hold of him. But one man I wanted to pinpoint actually come back from injury, bit of a resurgence for for Chris Cadden. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and listen, he's a key component for Hibs. You can't deny that he's been a miss for them. Um, since he, he got that long-term injury, because he, he, he's he been an important player. And you mentioned there about Hibs' defence being, that, you know, you want to get at them there because that's where you can hurt them. But he makes them stronger defensively when he's in that team and he, he shows that. And I think um, the fact he's come back off a long way up and he's, you know, he doesn't look like he's missed a step. He really doesn't. You know, he's he's at it. Um, and that's a, a, a real boost. I mean, he's, he's a player as well, Chris Cadden, that, I, I remember him playing at Motherwell when he was younger um, and there was you know, a lot of positive talk about him at the time about how he was a young boy at the time and you know, he was going to go places and um, he maybe didn't reach the heights he'd like to. I know he did have some time down south. Uh, I think it was at Plymouth or something like that. I think he was at for a, a spell. Um, but certainly he's been a, a huge player for Hibs and it's good to see him um back and, and, and playing again, particularly with that injury that he had because it's, it was a bad one he got and, you know, nice to see him back and nice to see him firing the way that he seems to be because I think Hibs are going to need that. I still think, although it's tight, I don't see Hibs really squeezing their way into the top six fold. I think that's, I don't, it's not gone, but I just think Dundee, Kilmarnock, St Mirren in particular have got a wee bit, just not by much, but you know, we'll be St Mirren and Dundee anyway, they just get a wee bit more consistency in their results and Hibs seem to be able to build up. 
Well, obviously, Hibs are in there at the moment due to the, the call off today. Dundee not able to reclaim that position. Hibs next game is actually at Ibrox against Rangers, uh, funnily enough. So that'll be Nupla, we hope. Um, just on Chris Cadden, uh, he obviously he went away to the US of A, uh, and then he was he was loaned back, I think, to, to Oxford United. But so, they'd been playing a 16 year old there at times this season. So, as you say, brings a bit more balance to that right-hand side, and I think he could be integral for that final push. I know Lewis tipped them for sixth, you stuck with Dundee, and then I just plumped for Motherwell for a bit of variety, but I think that their hopes are fading fast, and again, that might come down to refereeing decisions, but we should don't hope so. Okay, um, just a couple of things in today's game. Let's talk about Rangers and, 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 and the game that never was. Connor, I know you're shaking your head. You were pretty disgusted about the fact that you know Dundee, for the for the fourth time this season, have been um, at a call-off due to just not taking care of the, their own business. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it can't, it can't continue like that because but the one thing we know is an absolute fact, Dundee will be a Premiership club again next season. They will be. Um, and we can't have another season of them getting games called off consistently because it's, as you see, four times now. That's more than any other club. They're the only, literally the only club or only sort of football league club in Britain, not just Scotland, but in Britain this weekend to have a game called off. Um and, you know, it doesn't just rain in Dundee. There's rain everywhere. But everybody else seems to be able to manage their pitch better. And the two things for me that are criminal about it is Dundee United play across the road for him. They've not had a single game postponed this season due to Waterlord pitch. It hasn't happened. Um, you know, the, the only games they've had postponed have been away games when they think they were supposed to play them fair or something like that. And that doesn't make sense because they're across the road. So it's not like the rain's going to be different, you know. Um they need to sort out, clearly there's a drainage issue, but with this game in particular, what they should have been doing, because it's a televised game, so it's a big game for them as well, they don't get on the telly that often. Somebody should have recognised that there was going to be a bit of rain and understand the problems they've got. Why can they not put a cover over their pitch to protect it? You can just get a big, I don't know, a big massive tarpaulin or just something that you can put over the pitch to try and mitigate and protect it. They didn't do that. And then the handling of how it's Pulled off as well, and, and the manner of it, it's not good enough because you've got fans travelling there. You know, Rangers fans are, are going there. You know, either they're going up to Glasgow, which is near five minute joint. By the way, you know, it's, it's about two hours, which isn't, you know, by any stretch the longest game. But the fact that you know, the, as as Paul McGarrigal says there, and he's absolutely spot on that the the Dundee ground staff were working on that pitch for five o'clock this morning. Um, and it was clear because Don Roberts and actually I heard him he got interviewed earlier which is interesting you don't always hear for referees in these situations and he said the same he said that there had been an initial decision earlier on um, that had been agreed that they were going to do a final pitch inspection he got there because they had obviously you know with the ground staff and whatever had maybe inspected it beforehand and recognised it was maybe not going to be up to scratch so he's come in and done that and then it's it's had to be called off but People are travelling down there and you're calling a game off 90 minutes before kickoff. I mean, Dundee need to get their, their, their house in order. Otherwise, <coughs> the SPFL are going to have to step in, the governing bodies, and either lay fines on clubs for excessive match postponements or abandonments because even Ross County, even away up in Dingwall, they don't seem to have the level of games postponed as Dundee. It's incredible. Um so there has to be, but then, do you know what it comes down to? It's this lack of a standard across the board when it comes to the top flight about, you know, pitch standards and where they should be at. We've seen it too many times this season. We went to St Johnston. That was a dreadful pitch to play football, but they still got a game on it to be fair to them, but it's still a poor pitch. Um, we've seen it plenty of times in the past. They need to raise the standard that's expected. Um, and clearly Dundee, you know, somebody wants to, to phone the, the plumber or something because there's clear drainage problems going on with that pitch that need resolving because I tell you what, you get another bit of rain, that won't be the last game they get called after this year. Well, you, you, you say there about a couple of things I want to actually come back to you on is sanctions. Sanctions, uh, fines, but it's point deductions, forfeiting matches. There needs to be something in place to, 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 to put them off this happening consistently. Okay, 
one one occasion you you it's a slap on the wrist, but if it's repetitive and it's the same thing concurrent, then there needs to be there needs to be somebody needs to come down on them. And this is where we spoke about earlier. Um, there's no strong leadership from a governing body. No, there's absolutely none, and and it, and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be something that's implemented, you know, in a way that's it's more about well, games get called off. There can be things that happen that are out of your control, right? Uh, you know, you can get bad winters where the snow's really bad, and that happens to everybody, right? And you've got to, you just have to accept that is what happens, right? But in the middle of March, you shouldn't be having a game rained off when every other game in Britain has been able to go ahead, because what they should be doing, the SPFL. Is you know, prevention is better than cure, right? So they should be encouraging a team like Dundee and should be saying, listen, you've had multiple problems with us this season. You need to put things in place and take actions before these games because you can all see the weather forecast. Put something over your pitch to protect it because I'm telling you, see if you had a tarpaulin or something over that, most of the water would have went on that. So the pitch, okay, it has still got a bit wet, but it would have been playable because you'd have m- mitigated against it. They didn't do that. For whatever reason, they didn't do it. And to me, that's in, you know, it's negligence. And they need to be pulled up for that. And I think in, in future, I think you get, maybe you give them two, two strikes, you know, for what a long pitch in circumstances like this, where it's not been an issue for anybody else. And then you say, look, you need to put things in place or here's the consequence of, of doing that. It's difficult for the SPFL because they would need agreement of, I think, nine of the 12 clubs to implement a rule like that. But I'd like to think most clubs would want that because you want games to go ahead because the issue is going to be now, that game's going to be rescheduled. The two dates they're looking at, one is the Wednesday before we play Celtic. And that's, I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. Even though, okay, say that game's a, a Sunday, the Celtic game, they've already now got an advantage in that, albeit we are having a game in hand, they've now gone back top. They're probably going to go into that game on at the top unless we play before them. But to give an, an unfair you know, advantage to them, we are having to play a game we shouldn't have to play in that midweek seems unfair. So they should do it the week after, which is the other date that's pr- proposed, and that way, everything's kept fine and, and 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 fair because it's just no, it's not good enough, and it's having impacts um, on on clubs, not just us, but you know, I think it was it Ross County earlier this season were supposed to go to Dundee, couldn't go, and then they end up falling, you know, a bit a gap behind because they've got this game in hand that they can't get played. You always want points on the board instead of games in hand. Listen, it shows as well, we spoke about, you know, plastic pitches need to be removed from the top flight, but grass has its own problems as well. Okay, dokie, there was a couple of questions, Connor, that got fired in that I want to put to you just before we call it a night. Um, mm. First one is from Alan Kelly, actually. He said, disappointed the game is cancelled by heavy rain, but in today's game, should a top flight club be in this position? I think we've kind of answered that there, but if you take that one for me. Yeah, I think we've pretty much covered that. Um, look, the, the, the long and short of it is, no, they shouldn't. Um, I think when you look at our neighbours down south, albeit they have significantly more money than our clubs do, but you almost never see a game postponed down there for a waterlogged pitch. Usually when their games are postponed, they're postponed because of frozen pitches or because it's bad winter and snow. Very rarely is it because it's been raining. Um, and I think it, it's, you know, and Philip Clement said it as well, it tells you a lot when that's the only game in Britain that gets cancelled because of rain. When it's, It seems to be that pitch in particular. But Dunfermline, to be fair, they've had a number of games cancelled in the Championship as well. Their pitch is coaching, but they're not in the top flight, so you don't need to worry about that so much. But um, no, top flight clubs shouldn't be in that position. But to be fair, Alan, one thing I would say, the SPFL, not only do they need to look at sanctions, but they also need to put supports in place for these clubs because it might not be feasible for Dundee to go and afford state-of-the-art drainage and under full heat and stuff like that to try and prevent it. Well, do you know what to do then? Get rid of VAR, stop making them pay money for that and pump into the pitches. Yeah, well, I absolutely. Um, clearly, VAR I hasn't watched, been I, really I watched that game on Friday night, the Championship, the Dunfermline, Dundee United. It's so great just to watch a game that ebbs and flows. Ref, ref blows his whistle. It's a, it's a, it's a decision. 
goal goes in, ref blows his whistle, you know it's a goal. You're not having that sort of, oh, wait a minute, let's have a look, what's going to happen? I, I just, I just, I just yeah. think, it, and and then there's funds there. Well, no one, we've, no, we've not got the embarrassment of riches at the top fights in Europe. So why not keep that money for other things, i.e., put it into your park? I listen. I would, I would agree with that. I would absolutely. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all if that was the the, the investment strategy they chose to use. Unfortunately, the genie's out the bottle, and uh, I don't see VR being being rolled back down, uh, rolled back on. I think it'll be you know they'll double down and until they can find a, a means to make it work. But listen, it's it's not a bad shout because we've seen, you know, I mean, you know, to go back to St Mullen County a couple of weeks ago, they didn't even check an incident. So they're not even doing the job they're getting paid for when they're not checking things. So certainly not a bad shout. And if anyone from the pavilion is watching, that was Connor's audition for this year's Aladdin. Um, get in touch. 01416287237. Um Paul, you had one as well. Paul says, question, uh, what three Scottish players would you like to see at Rangers? Do you think they would improve the team? I think maybe he means, obviously, from, from the league itself, Connor. I think, you know, we've obviously spoke about David Watson. He's probably mm-hmm. top of the pops. Lennon Miller would be in the conversation. Could you think of a another? I mean, I can't believe you never said Lord Shanklin there. That's criminal for you. Um yeah, you're, you're losing your staunch Shanky points. I, um, I was kind of thinking about youngsters, but definitely Lauren Shanky without a without a. Yeah, in terms of youngsters, oh well, I mean, listen, I, the two you've outlined there, absolutely, Lauren Miller and and David Watson, without question, would be would be in there. Um, some uh, Paul's put Connor Barr in there in the chats. Yeah, I can see, I can see the merits. Um, <coughs> no, I struggle to think. Yeah, third one actually, to be honest with you. Um, if it, okay, then I'll narrow it down. If you could only have one, if I could only have one, oof. um, if I could only have one, I think it would be Lennon Miller. I think, right? Yeah, interesting. Lewis, I'm sure, won't be happy. Davy Watson, absolutely, is a great show. I think both, I think, I would take. Um, but obviously, it's got to be a bit timing because. We've seen it before, you know, we took Jake Hasty and it clearly wasn't the right time to bring him in. He should have he really should have stayed at, at Motherwell what for him. What did you like what did you like about Lennon Miller? Well, what I like about Lennon Miller is the I, I just the quality that he seems to possess and the I think it's he's seeming maturity because he just you know, he, he glides across that pitch at times and floats by players and you just think, This is a young guy, he shouldn't have this level of call. I mean you're watching, him, you're watching him and you don't realise you're oh, watching a 17 year old, that's what it is. Yeah, it? absolutely. I mean, listen, this is, he has went. I mean, I go back to the game when they played Celtic at Fur Park, right? He absolutely minced Callum McGregor. This is a guy who is a, a highly decorated captain of Celtic. He's won plenty of trophies. Not only that, this is a guy who's played in a major international tournament for Scotland. And Lennon Miller's just absolutely left him for dead. Um, you know, we one of the best turns you'll see this season that obviously then leads to him assisting a, a, a terrific goal for Blair Spittle. So I just to have that level of confidence about you when you're that young that I don't care who I'm playing against, I'm going to take you on. I just, I love that. That's what I love in players. And don't get me wrong, you're still going to have wee niggles here and there that you're going to have to get out of them. And, and it's maybe a couple of years off, but I I, I just love the swagger that he seems to have. Um, and if he keeps going the way he's gone, listen, you never know. But I certainly wouldn't be disappointed with David Watson either. Don't shoot me loose. <laughs> He'll be chatting your door. All right, then. Excellent. Uh, good shift, that, for the two of us. David as well, putting his, his help in early doors. Thanks to everyone who put that, their comments in as well. Um, it was nice to, to have you along with us. As always, like and subscribe. It does help the pod grow. There is a podcast tomorrow night. It won't be a phone-in, obviously, due to the international break, but the guys will be on discussion how they think that the squad will look um, over the summer window. Um, we'll be back with a, a Scottish football show on Friday night. We're doing building reaction from, from the Netherlands game, and then we'll be back again the following week from the Northern Ireland game. So if you if you like watching the national team, then do join us for that as well. And there's a real special, I don't know who I want to, I'll tell you, there's a special on Sunday night. If you're a fan of Galazzo on Channel 4 in the 90s, then do join us next Sunday night, 7.30. That one is not to be missed. Um, but listen, for, as, as for tonight, Connor, as always, you've been an absolute star. 
Uh, you've carried the the, the the pod tonight, so delighted to have you on with me, mate, and enjoy the rest of your week. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say something there. No, you're, you're all right. <laughs> well, uh, listen, pleasure no. as always talking about Scottish football. Um, it's the one thing that we we, we we love to do, um, and that's what this show's about, is about trying to keep that conversation going. So, no, I absolutely enjoyed it. 100%. All right, guys, enjoy your evening. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.